Volume 4 is called Animus de Lendi, which means the desire to destroy. I remind my viewers that in these videos I was asked to give an overview of the volumes of my collection, analyzing Vatican II. So, after reaching the conclusion that the texts of the Council were ambiguous, which was the goal of Volume 1 in the murky waters of Vatican II, I asked, since the texts are ambiguous, what is the spirit inspired the texts that allow us to interpret them? Studying the spirit of the Council, as we have seen in the two last videos, I show that the popes, as well as theologians, who played important roles in the elaboration of the final texts, expressed a strong hatred toward the institution of the Catholic Church as she was in the past. This hatred was revealed by an ensemble of offenses which I listed in volumes 2 and 3 of my collection. I call those volumes Animus Injuriendi, the desire to offend. Volumes 4 and 5 analyzed the desire that those prelates and theologians manifested to destroy the Church as she was in the past, as the fruit of close to 2,000 years of martyrdoms, doctrinal fights, temporal conquests, spiritual progress, and missionary efforts. They desired to destroy the very institution of the Catholic Church, her monarchical structure, and her hierarchical distribution of powers. This desire becomes indisputable insofar as we study the actions taken, the speeches delivered, and documents issued by those prelates and theologians who led the Church into the Conciliar Revolution. That is, we are seeing a complete turnaround regarding the orientation the Church followed since she was founded until Vatican II. It is to describe this planned destruction that I wrote Volume 4, called Animus de Lendi 1, Desire to Destroy 1. I will summarize it here today. More specifically, what do they want to destroy? The fundamental characteristics of the Church as she existed until Vatican II. They were to be militant, monarchical, magisterial, and sacral. First, the Catholic Church is militant because she has engaged in many types of fight proper to her mission. She fights for the purity of the faith against heresies. She fights against her external enemies, paganism, false religions like Judaism, Islamism, Buddhism, and Hinduism, and also the secret forces who are agents of the devil that want to get rid of the church founded by Christ and its fruit, Christendom. She fights against internal enemies. These enemies can be agents who infiltrated inside her ranks, or they can be Catholics who take a wrong path and devise bad doctrines. She must maintain vigilance over novelties that appear in her bosom in order to discern what is good and evil and smash the evil doctrine. She also fights against the corruption of customs in both the temporal and the spiritual spheres. Finally, she has to fight constantly against spiritual enemies that are always trying to drag Catholics to hell. These enemies are the devil, the world, and the flesh. Second, the Catholic Church is fundamentally monarchical because she has a hierarchical structure. 
and at the head of the hierarchy of the bishops is the Pope. The bishops are successors of the apostles, and the Pope is the successor of St. Peter, who was designated by our Lord to be the head of the church. It is from the Pope that the church receives her life. The bishops are superiors who command and teach the clergy and the laity. The Pope commands and teaches the bishops, the clergy, and laity. The temporal hierarchies are based on the people, like a tree that takes its life from the ground. The spiritual hierarchy is based upon heaven, like a chandelier that is supported by the ceiling from which it hangs. So, the entire hierarchy of the church is supported by our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven by means of his vicar on earth, the sovereign pontiff. Those who believe that the power of the Catholic Church comes from the decisions of the councils are wrong. The power of the Church comes from our Lord through the Pope. The councils are a frame that give relevance to and reinforce the decisions of the Pope, but the councils are not the source of the Church's power. Those who believe that the power of the Church comes from the bishops, the clergy, or the laity also err. Third, the Catholic Church is magisterial, that is, she teaches Catholics what they must believe and profess in order to glorify God and save their souls because she is the only authentic guardian and infallible interpreter of revelation. As an authentic guardian, she integrally conserves revelation as it was passed from our Lord Jesus Christ to the apostles and from the apostles to those who follow revelation through scripture and tradition. It is this ensemble of truth of revelation that the Church teaches her faithful as being the holy faith that all need to profess to be members of the Church. As the infallible interpreter, she defines dogmas drawn from the treasure of revelation, which are not clear in the past, and proposes them to the faithful. This was the case of the dogma of Immaculate Conception of Mary. Further, as an interpreter, she settles disputes about the doctrinal points that are open to discussion. This is the case of the dogmatic definition of the Petrine primacy issued at Vatican Council I in 1870. Fourth, the Catholic Church is sacral, that is, the actors of cult and ceremony she carries out generate a spiritual atmosphere that speaks of the sublimity of what they are. This atmosphere, which often remains in the edifice itself after the acts and ceremonies are over, is a pretaste of heaven and feeds the soul of the faithful in their thirst for elevation. Sacrality is also present in the pomp and circumstance that surrounds each member of the hierarchy and mainly in the Pope as they exercise their roles of governing, teaching, applying justice and administering the sacraments. Therefore, we can end this introduction by reaffirming that the Catholic Church is fundamentally militant, hierarchical, magisterial, and sacred. The spirit of the Council, which inspired the Conciliar Revolution, is turned toward destroying these characteristics.
The progressivists elaborate many theories trying to justify their desire to destroy the Catholic Church. In this series of videos, I am highlighting just a few of them. Now, I ask your attention for one that is particularly harmful. It is the doctrine of the kenosis. Kenosis in Greek means self-debasement or self-divestment. According to this theory, the Church should voluntarily divest herself and annihilate herself following the example of Christ. While exhorting the Philippians to be humble and detach themselves from their material and spiritual goods, St. Paul says, For let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be himself equal to God, but debased himself, taking the form of a slave, being made to the likeness of men, and in shape found as man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. St. Paul then says that because of this humility, God exalted the name of Jesus Christ above all names. So the goal of St. Paul was to give the Philippians an example of detachment from their material goods and their legitimate titles of honor, as well as a lesson in humility. The Church has interpreted these verses in a similar way. Indeed, she teaches this. Jesus Christ has both a divine nature, the form of God, and a human nature, the form of man. He is the true God and was not arrogant robbery for him to say that he was equal to God as it was for Lucifer the noblest angel. Being God, he relinquished the majesty proper to his divinity, debased himself, to become a man as if he were a man like any other. As the God-man, and in obedience to the divine decision to redeem mankind, he experienced all the privations of human nature, even the death on the cross. This is how the Catholic Church interprets these verses. I propose that to this message of detachment and humility, we should add a note that has not being stressed sufficiently. Since our Lord Jesus Christ became man in the womb of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, after her consent, we could say with Saint Louis Grignon de Montfort that the Divine Word abandoned the Divine Paradise to inhabit another paradise. He exchanged his throne in heaven for a throne on earth which was the body of his mother. It was from her immaculate flesh that his human body was formed. Although there was an act of detachment in this exchange, I propose that there was also, so to speak, a great profit for him to live for nine months in that exquisite paradise. Although there was an act of humility in relinquishing the majesty of divinity. There was also an act of glorification in becoming the first slave of Mary. Thus, he showed that alongside the path of suffering, he had to walk to redeem the children of Eve's sin. He was inaugurating a path of glory for the children of Mary's fidelity.
Independent of these good interpretations, the progressivists, following old and recent heresies, came out with a gloomy and tragic version of these same verses. Which old heresies are the progressives following? Analyzing these verses, Father Cornelius Alapidi points out the various heretical doctrinal errors made in the past. Chrysostom said that Arius erred in asserting that the Son was less than the Father. Photinus erred in teaching that the Son was not the form, but the energy of the Father. Sibelius erred in defending the opinion that the Son was not equal to the Father, but one same person with the Father. Nestorius erred in attributing two persons to Christ, Christ the Man and Christ the God. And finally, Apollinarius erred in depriving Christ of rational intelligence and a soul, and consequently of humanity. Which recent heresies are they following? The doctrine of the kenosis was drawn from these ancient heresies and especially from some Luther's theses updated by Protestant reinterpretations and Greek schismatic concepts from the 19th and the 20th centuries. To this bad doctrine, some progressivists added elements of German idealism, especially a certain nostalgic and romantic note typical of Schelling, and the dialectical method proper to Hegel, along with the more recent phenomenological theories of Husserl and Scheller. The result was a mixture of philosophy and theology that acted as a kind of drain where the errors of various periods emptied and intermixed. There they were brought to a boil by the modernist progressivist apostasy and raised the present ardor to destroy the Holy Church. This theory also adds a note of pessimism to the religious view of evolution. According to this view, in order to redeem the universe and mankind from their congenital fragmentation and reintegrate them into the original whole, the divine word or logos was obliged to debase himself, abandon his state of primeval plenitude and immerse himself into the fragmented universe. Thence, he would experience this fragmentation in the most disconcerting aspects and, in this state, transmit to the separate parts his unifying cosmic energy, which is love. This love would make possible the integration of all things into successively larger bodies through an ascending process of evolution that would accelerate and become more perfect as the unity among the various parts increased. Only after this redemptive integration would mankind and the universe be ready to unite with the Logos, which is seen as the end of the evolutionary process. Thus, the Logos, the beginning of the process, would also become its end, Christ the Alpha and the Omega. Applying this to ethics, this debasement of the Logos is presented as the model for the more universalized man to redeem the more fragmented ones. At this point in the progressivist thinking, a law appears demanding that everything integrate into a more universal whole. It is the law of the voluntary debasement of those who are in some way closer to the totality than others. 
Evolution could only run its course and attain its goal, the reuniting of all into the Logos, when this ethical metaphysical law would be enforced. Then the reintegration of humanity and the universe into the Logos would be complete. Only in this way would there be a full integration into the plenitude and man would attain supreme happiness and glory. This metaphysical and ethical desire to debase oneself was transposed into theological terms. Interpreting the verses I mentioned earlier of the Epistle of St. Paul to the Philippians in a heterodox way, progressivists following the footsteps of the Protestants imagine that the Word, upon becoming incarnate, emptied himself of God and did this voluntarily. This is, according to them, the paradigm of self-destruction in theological terms. According to this interpretation, the gnosis of the world would have various successive degrees of annihilation. The world would have emptied himself of his divinity through the incarnation. He would have chosen not simply to be a man, but to be the lowliest among men, a slave. He would have voluntarily delivered himself over to die, and he accepted not just any death, but the most ignominious one, crucifixion. On the cross, he chose the company of criminals. After his death, he chose to descend into hell in solidarity with the reprobates. According to this progressivist theory, having reached the paroxysm of kenosis, with his descent into hell, Christ achieved the union of all the separated fragments, truth and error, good and evil, pulchrum and dorando, beauty and horror. From the depths of humiliation, at the end of the Hegelian march of violent contrasts, glory would be born. A resurrection would have begun in hell. Once these principles of the theory of kenosis have been set forth, it is not difficult to apply them to the life of the Church and to raise a hypothesis to elucidate the mysterious process of self-destruction spoken of by Paul VI. As the mystical body of Christ, the Church should imitate the Redeemer. Progressivists argue that she ought to relinquish her sanctity just as Christ gave up his divinity. She should abandon her power as he did with his omnipotence. She should renounce her majesty, riches, eminence, and sacrality, following his example. From queen of nations, she should become a slave of the world. From this comes Vatican II's church servant and poor, that is, the church imitating Christ who took the form of a slave. Instead of the first, she should become the last. From the mistress of truth, she should become a pilgrim walking in error and darkness, in quest of a new unity of the faith. She should no longer be exclusivist and militant, but tolerant, seeking the company of bandits. 
she should voluntarily deliver herself over to death and seek solidarity with those who are in the hell of anathemas, crimes and vices. Then and only then, by means of this kenosis and tolerance, could the Church integrate all the world's disunited elements and prepare them for the final Christ, the Omega Christ. Only in this final kenotic state, when the Church would be transformed into something completely different from what she had been until Vatican II, when she would be confounded with criminals and ready to cast herself into the hell of marginality, would the Church supposedly spread the fruits of redemption among mankind and have an imaginary glorification? This is the progressivist doctrine of justification to advance the process of self-destruction of the Holy Church. This theory of kenosis explains one of the important pretexts the progressives use to destroy the Church. We have heard Pope Francis mention it often. But one should know that there are other theories also alleged to destroy the main characteristics of the Church. I will list the principal ones. To destroy the militant character of the Catholic Church, the progressives preach tolerance. They are transforming the Church into a tolerant Church. They attack the Crusades and apologize for the past religious wars. We saw Paul VI send the standard of Lepanto to the Muslims. John Paul II apologized for the Crusades and the Battle of Vienna against the Turks. We saw Benedict XVI apologize for the sin of intolerance. And we have seen Pope Francis state that the Catholics who fought against the heretics were possessed by the devil. Many other papal criticisms of the Inquisition, of apologetics, of disputes against heretics are also abhorred by this new tolerant progressivist church. To destroy the monarchical characteristic of the Catholic Church, they promote democracy inside of the Church, following the model of the French Revolution, which is based on the motto Liberty, Equality and Fraternity. The efforts to install the so-called Synodal Church is nothing but an attempt to destroy every monarchical aspect of the Catholic Church. So, we are seeing the Pope lowering himself to be at the level of the bishops, the bishops lowering themselves to the level of the priests, and the priests presenting themselves as mere representatives of the people. This new egalitarian Church, People of God, is the opposite of what the Catholic Church has always been. To destroy the magisterial character of the Catholic Church, the progressives make relative all the dogmas and the scriptures under different allegations. They pretend that the fundamental doctrines stated in those sources must change because the historical circumstances are different. The language changed. The dogmatic formulae of biblical books were influenced by the cultural, regional, or psychological environments of their authors. So, the dogmatic doctrine of the Church should change to fit with the evolution of the times. Consequently, the moral doctrine should also adapt to new circumstances 
fall in the different epochs or places. To destroy the sacrality and sanctity of the church, the progressivists disseminate the idea of the poor church and the sinner church. The poor church is one who has no pomp, no richness in her cult and no solemnity in her rites. The grandiose cathedrals are abandoned under the charge that they were imitating the temporal palaces of the past. The Pope and bishops abandoned their stature as monarch and princes to look like the men of the street. The theory of the sinner church is a corollary of that of the poor church. The progressivists affirm that in the fourth century, when she abandoned the catacombs, the Catholic Church began to imitate the customs and ways of being of the nobles, princes, and kings. This would be why she acquired temporal properties and built magnificent churches. This would be a sin. To be pure, again, the Catholic Church should abandon all her temporal riches and return to the apostolic times when, allegedly, she lived without any material goods. These are the main theories that I found which explain why the Catholic Church has been attacked by her own hierarchs and theologians in several different fields. I hope it will help my viewer understand the process of destruction that has been taking place inside of the Church since Vatican Council II.